This is episode three of our introduction to John Knox, Scotland's reformer. In this podcast, we're going to cover Knox's understanding of the Christian Church and of the sacraments, two very important aspects of the covenanting struggle in the 17th century. Book of the Month. Follow the link to buy your copy. During the months of July and August, we'll be looking at John Knox, Scotland's reformer. If you'd like to learn more about John Knox, and there is a lot to learn, there's plenty of resources online. And if you prefer books, a good starting point is an excellent little primer, John Knox, Fearless Faith, by Stephen Lawson. It's just 100 pages, and it's packed with fast-moving information about Knox. And there's a link to buy the book on www semper-reformata.com throughout July and August. Just follow the link in the episode notes. The book costs just £5.49. A small part of that goes to support this podcast. The Book of the Month, John Knox, Fearless Faith, by Stephen Lawson. Let's look at Knox's doctrine of the Church. This segment of Christian truth is the most important in our understanding of the motives of the Covenanters, and in Knox's teaching and in the Scots Confession, we see the seeds of the doctrine that was more fully elaborated upon by Samuel Rutherford, a doctrine which would bring the sword to Scotland and cause those who despise the reform position to spill the blood of her martyrs. The church, of course, is divided into the church that we can see and the church that God can see. The church invisible is the church that only God sees. The Lord knows who are his. The Scottish view on the invisible church was similar to that of any other group of Reformed churches. The visible church was the same church as the invisible church, except that to God, It was seen in its entirety. He saw his church complete as one church, comprised of believers from every age, including those in the ages still to come. Of this church, Christ was enthroned as head and king, and his subjects in his kingdom were bound to uphold his laws and do his bidding. The visible church, on the other hand, was the outward expression of the invisible church, and Christ was still the head of his church, even if it was confined to one place and comprised of only those who were alive at that time. No other king could sit on Christ's throne, and no one else could usurp Christ's authority in his church. There was a definite distinction to be made between the kingdom of man and the kingdom of God. The citizens of the kingdom avowed the headship of their sovereign. They acknowledged his authority. They accepted his word as a regulative authority in matters of doctrine and worship and discipline and government. They obeyed their king, and that obedience took precedence over obedience to any earthly king. Luther had believed in the doctrine of the godly prince, whose task and responsibility it was to reform the church. Only the lawfully ordained authorities could carry out that task. But Scotland had no such prince, and the church had no such doctrine. An ungodly king, or for that matter even a godly one, had in the Presbyterian mind no right to rule in Christ's kingdom. So six basic rules governed Knox's attitude to church and state. Firstly, in a conflict between the law of the state and God's law, then God's law must prevail. Secondly, the state is obligated to protect true religion. 
the mass was banned by the reformed state of Scotland. Knox said in a letter to Queen Mary, One mass is more fearful to me than if ten thousand enemies were landed in any part of the realm. And that's despite the fact that the king was allowed no more say in the governance of the church than any other lay person. 3. Knox believed in the right of armed resistance. Although the sword should not be the first weapon of choice for Christians, he had no qualms about resisting princes or rulers if they exceeded their bounds. I suppose this has an interesting bearing on contemporary issues here in Northern Ireland and in the United Kingdom. How far can a person go in resisting the state when the state takes decisions which are unbiblical and which restrict our ancient freedoms to worship? 4. Knox did not deny the right of the monarch to exist. He remarked that he would just as well live under Queen Mary as under Nero. His allegiance to the state was on the condition that the monarch did not stain his or her hands with the blood of the saints of God. 5. Church and state both have responsibility for the relief of the poor and for the education of the people, and in those efforts church and state should work together. 6. The church is obliged to maintain spiritual discipline, and the state's responsibility is to punish wrongdoers. In Knox's church, the elders met every week to enforce discipline. Adulterers, Sabbath breakers, backsliders would be brought before the session. The state, however, should be first to act in serious cases, especially in capital cases. So Knox and his followers laid the basis of the Covenanter dispute with the Episcopalians. In Scotland, the doctrine of the visible church came to hold such a place of control as that it is largely in connection with the application and the working out of that doctrine that the most remarkable struggles and discussions of national life have taken place. It regards the church in its visible form as a kingdom, with a king of its own. That king, King Jesus, is not an absentee monarch, nor is he only a figurehead. He is looked upon as the head of the church, as it is his acknowledged realm. But knowing the doctrine of the church requires also that we should know something about the Reformed view on the sacraments. There was, of course, a wide divergence of opinion among the Reformers regarding the nature of the sacraments and the way that they work. All of them had left behind the beliefs of Rome. But to what extent? The belief of the Roman Church, in brief, was that the bread and wine at the pronouncement of the priest became the actual body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and was sacrificed as the communicants took the bread and wine. So the sacraments worked ex opere operato. In other words, even if both the priest and the recipient were unworthy, the sacraments were still efficacious, in that they in and of themselves were the means by which grace was conveyed to the sinner. Martin Luther still believed in the real presence of Christ in the elements at the Lord's Supper, and he based his belief on the necessary ubiquity of Christ, although he insisted that no transubstantiation was necessary, and that no sacrifice took place on the altar. The Zurich reformer Ulrich Zwingli reduced the Lord's Supper to a memorial meal only, emphasising the command of the Lord, this do in remembrance of me, although in later life he may have moved slightly towards a more Calvinistic position. And Calvin had steered a course between the positions of Luther and the early Zwingli. 
He had argued that the person of Christ was received, not in the bread and wine, but with the bread and wine, and that the efficacy of the sacrament was restricted to those who were Christian believers, and that they enjoyed the presence of God by faith around the Lord's table. There was, of course, no place whatsoever for any sacrifice at the Lord's table in Calvin's Geneva. Well, as a disciple of Calvin, one would expect Knox to follow a similar moderate path. And so the Scottish Confession disclaimed the doctrine that the sacraments were but bare signs. Some have tried to write into the Confession an underlying tendency to baptismal regeneration, that baptism itself is a means of saving grace. But in the historic Scottish Reform movement, there is no basis whatsoever for such a view. Knox used Calvin's catechism for the instruction of young people, and referring to the reception of saving grace, this catechism clearly taught how and when is it that the sacraments have this effect. The answer was, when a man receiveth them in faith, seeking only in them Christ and his grace. Well, that'll do for this lesson. In our next lesson, the fourth and final lesson in this short series on John Knox, we'll be asking, what kind of a man was John Knox? And we'll get a look at his married life, his church life, his preaching and his prayer life. Don't forget to listen next time. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode of the podcast, please help to make it better known by opening the podcast app on your phone or mobile device. Then, search for The Semper Reformata Podcast. Subscribe and give it a 5-star rating. See you next time.